continue to raise a hallelujah in the middle of whatever you are going through. Why? Because God is still there in the middle of it. You might be surrounded by fear, surrounded by anxiety, surrounded by depression, surrounded by whatever you came in with this morning. But those things are surrounded by God. No matter what you're going through, it's not the end. It's not the end. He says, for I know the plans I have for you. Have for you, not had. So that means still, he still has a plan for you. If you are standing here this morning, you are breathing alive and well. He still has a plan for your life. This is not the end. This is not the end. He is more than able to bring you through, to bring you out, to bring you over. So God, we lift our hands to you this morning. We open up our mouths and we continue to raise a hallelujah and declare that there is nobody like you. Only you are more than able to heal, to cover, to set free, to deliver. You are more than able. You're more than able, God. You're more than able, God. When did I start to forget all of the great things you did? When did I throw away faith for the impossible? Oh. Did I start to believe that you weren't sufficient for me? Why do I talk myself out of seeing miracles? Yes, cause you are more than
this morning and there's so much more to our story even if we can't see it right now 
we believe and we trust God that you are more than able. Yes. You are more than able. 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 No. Amen, amen. If you believe that, come on, give God a hand. Praise. Hallelujah. 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 You may be seated. As you sit down, just turn around and tell three people, he's not done yet. He's not done yet. He's not done yet. He's not done yet. Amen, amen, amen. Well, praise the Lord. We're missing some, um, we're missing some lights, ain't we? We missed some lights. I thought we had more lights. There we go. Ah, there we go. There we go. There we go. Some lights. Welcome to fellowship. We're so glad to have you here. Anybody just glad to be in the house of the Lord today? Anybody just glad to be in the house? We are so thankful. We are a gospel-centered, multi-ethnic, intergenerational church. We exist to make disciples. Amen? Amen. And if this is your first time here, what a good Sunday to be here. If this is your first time here, would you just raise your hand and we just love to celebrate you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Welcome, 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 welcome. Welcome, welcome. It is so, so good to see all of you all here. Stop by the Connect Center outside. We love to get connected with you and um, find out more about you. You can find out more about us. We got a couple of big things going, coming on. Somebody shout, Root It. Let's get rooted. All right, let's try to sing it. One, two, three. Let's get rooted. Come on. The State Farm ain't got nothing on us. That is a, that's a great jingle. Um, yo, we only got a few more uh, spots. We're, we're filling up, um, but we would love to have you join us. If some of you have been praying, Lord, I want to go deeper this year. Uh, I want to start this year off being more spiritual, investing in my spiritual development more. Um, we got a great opportunity for you to take a big step in your discipleship journey. It's a 10-week discipleship journey and community here on Tuesday nights. Um, and you do life with people, but you also um, intentionally say, Lord, I want to put some practices in place for my soul, for my heart. And some of you, you already been, you, you prayed for this. So this may be the answer to your prayer. Root it. Sign up today. Afterwards, you can pick up the books. It launches this Tuesday. For those of you that aren't doing it, pray for those that are going through it, uh, that God would just stir their hearts and God would get glory in the midst of it. Amen? Amen. 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 All right. Next thing we got coming up uh, is baptism class. You can actually scan that QR code and sign up there. If you want to be baptized, take the next step in your faith development. We would love for you to do that. Uh, we want you to come to the class so that we can talk about what baptism means. So even if you're just curious, come to the class and experience it. We'll be doing the class Thursday uh, night and then Sunday morning. Go online to get the times and the details. We would love to have you uh, be baptized if you haven't done that yet. Uh, the other thing is we're doing old school pancake breakfast. Uh, and a couple of Saturdays, uh, we're going to be uh, here at the Fellowship Center, Saturday, March 23rd, 8 a.m., 11 a.m. This is just the fellowship with your church. We come in, we see you, you be crying, you leave service. We just want to have a time when we can see you without the snot bubble in your face. You know what I mean? We want to see you where we can just laugh and hang out and spend time together. So we'll start selling little tickets uh, next week, five dollars. Um, <clears throat> uh, and we would just love to just hang out and fellowship with one another. So that's Saturday, March 23rd. Um, it'll be a fun time to spend some time together with each other. Amen? Amen? All right. Today I'm talking about stories. And the question of the day is, what's your favorite story? Whether that's a movie, whether it's a book, what's your favorite story? Um, stand up. Oh ask your neighbor, what? Who said that? Oh, my God. <laughs> she just, did y'all hear her? She did a... She did an audible, oh my God. <laughs> What's wrong, honey? You got so many stories, and you're into theater. You're into, so you're a part of a storyteller. Just pick one. Just pick, just pick one story. She is overwhelmed. Somebody pray for her. Intercede on her behalf. Uh, but just, there can be a movie, just one. And no Bible stories. Don't be spiritually deep and wonderful. We'll save that for later. Um, <laughs> But your favorite story, movie, book, anything, stand up, turn around, greet your neighbor. Let's go. How about my turn? 
Grab a seat. Grab a seat. Grab a seat, grab a seat. One of the things that we celebrate on a weekly basis um, is not just um, our worship in singing, worship in sermons, but also our worship in giving, amen? God literally says, I, I bless my children, and a mark of being a part of my family is not just that you are a giver, but that you are a cheerful giver. In other words, my kids don't have bad attitudes when they give. Um, and God is inviting us as a part of our worship, not just to give, but to give with great joy, um, especially those that may be having a hard time in this season financially. Uh, those that finding employment has been a challenge or it's hard to make ends meet. It's a reminder to say all I have belongs to God. Uh, and God, my faith is always has been in you to provide. So my provision isn't going to come to what I'm holding on to. So I give generously that that you ask for, knowing that you are Jehovah Jireh. You are my provider. So we get to practice that faith. I love it. Somebody say practice faith. practice faith. So it's not enough just to sing faith or listen to faith. We get to practice faith. And one of the ways that we practice our faith is by giving to the Lord, uh, giving our tithes and our offerings. So I want to invite you to worship with us as we give unto the Lord today. And, um, and he says, try me. It's, it's one of those rare moments where God is like, I know this is going to be hard, but try me and you will find me faithful. So he says, so give. And when it comes to generosity, I want you to try me, test this principle out. If you're generous to the kingdom, the kingdom will always respond in generosity and abundance in your life. In other words, it's God's way of saying, I'm gonna take care of you. It's his way of saying, you take care of my business, I'll take care of your business. So let's try him as we are generous 
and give cheerfully. Father, we thank you so much for the privilege of being able to give. Um, thank you, Father, that I'm only able to give because of your abundant grace and goodness towards me. So regardless of the medium, uh, whether it's through passing the bucket here or some of us give online, God, some of us give through text, uh, regardless of the platform, God, we pray that our heart is postured with gratefulness and generosity in response, God, to your goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. So as we receive uh, the morning offering, as our ushers serve you, I'm going to invite you to multitask with me um, and grab your Bibles, grab your Bible, open up your Bible apps um, and meet me in the book of Job. Meet me in the book of Job. We're going to begin reading it around verse 13. So meet me in the book of Job, chapter 1. We're going to begin reading at verse 13. Book of Job, chapter 1. We'll begin reading at verse 13. Here we go. One day when Job's sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house, a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing and the donkeys were grazing nearby and the Sabims attacked and made off with them. Uh, they put the servants to the sword, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. Uh, while he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, the fire of God fell from the heavens and burned up the sheep and the servants, and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another messenger came and said, the Chaldeans formed three raiding parties and swept down on your camels and made off with them. They put the servants to the sword and I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, yet another messenger came and said, your sons and daughters were feasting and drinking wine at the oldest brother's house when suddenly a mighty wind swept in from the desert and struck the four corners of the house. It collapsed on them and they are dead. And I am the only one who has escaped to tell you. At this, Job got up tore his robe, shaved his head, then he fell to the ground in worship and said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. In all this, Job did not sin by charging God with wrongdoing. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for the word. Now, Father, we ask that you would speak, O oh Lord, like only you can. Would you tune our ear to your voice so that we might hear you ever so clearly? Turn our hearts toward you so that we might experience the fullness of all that you have for us. God, it's to that end that I ask that you stand in my body, think with my mind, Speak through my vocal cords those things you would have us say, know, and do. Father, may the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, be acceptable in thy sight. Oh, Lord, you are my strength. You are my redeemer. Get glory in this place. In Jesus' name. Every heart said amen. Amen. Hmm. What makes a good story? What makes a good story? I, I, I just want to hear from some of y'all. When you think about what you love about a good story, what you love about a good movie, what you love about it, what, what makes it good? What makes it good? Yes, ma'am. A happy ending. Let me tell you something. Ain't nothing worse than a bad ending. Like, especially one of them unresolved, kind of they want to make you think. No, 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 I didn't watch this movie to think. <laughs> or or they, they say, well, we just want to give you a taste of reality. We want it to make it realistic. No, my life is realistic. I'm escaping realistic. I came to watch some leave me happy. I won't happily ever after. Amen. Anybody else love a good 
a look good resolve. Don't, un, don't unresolve me and don't cliffhanger me to make me now have to watch the next one. Don't play with my emotions, Tommy. You know what I mean? Like, don't do that. Yes, ma'am. Um, overcoming obstacles. Overcoming obstacles. Everyone loves a good, if you think about this, there's no story without that. If you think about every story, even like Bambi, uh, well, that's probably not a good example. Uh, <laughs> But you just think about the most simple, innocent story. They all have to have something to overcome. That's good. Anybody else? Who else? Who, uh, yes, 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 yes. Good moral. Like a good moral, a good ethic, a good meaning, a good meaning. Yeah, that's good. That's good. Yes, ma'am. Conflict is a great thing. Conflict. Got to have a good fight <laughs> so you can have a good win. That's good. Anybody else? Come on. Where are we at? What, what, yes. Good character. Good character where you just fall in love. Character development. Good character. Yes, back in the back. Characters, the characters. That's good. That's good. That's good. Yes, sir. Yeah. Triumph of good over evil. Yes, yes, yes. No, that's good. Yeah. A plot twist. Yeah, when you don't see it coming and you'd be like, oh, snap. Yes. A good villain. Yeah, 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 yeah. A good villain. That's good. Yes. Oh, come on now. Okay, then. That's good. That's, that's a good one. That's a good one. Yes, yes. Storyteller. Like the story, like the, just a good story. Got it, got it, got it. From the person telling the story. That's really good. That's really good. Yes. Good looking leading man. Good looking leading man. <laughs> huh? Y'all may need to switch seats. Y'all may, she, she may be. <laughs> No, I, I love the elements of a good story. Um, the beginning of Job is fascinating to me. I don't know if you've ever slowed down to pay attention to the opening sequence, but they're just all there living a normal life, and all of a sudden calamity hits the house. And time after time, everyone and everything is destroyed except one person. And it says, while he was yet speaking, somebody else came. And they tell a story of complete calamity. And they're the only person that survived. And that was to tell the, the story, deliver the message. And while he was yet speaking, it, the same thing happened again. So the opening sequence of, of Job starts with these interesting characters that we never even see again. But the story doesn't happen without them. They were spared for one reason, and it was just to tell the story. Now imagine they had one job, and they didn't do it. I guess the question that I want us to wrestle with for the next few moments together, what if we've survived and overcome for one reason, and that's to tell the story? What if God's faithfulness has had a motive this whole time? And it was so that you might tell the story of what he's done. They came up to Job and said, we only had one job. We knew. We, whew, everybody, nobody else around us made it. We made it, and we made it for one reason, and that's so we could come and tell this story. Not only I do I want you to consider that you are here to tell a story, but I also want you to consider, what if you had one job and you didn't do it? What if, you, what if God got you here for one reason and you ain't even do it? How many like um, a good Netflix binge? Like a good Netflix binge. Oh, come on. Yes, hallelujah. I got a witness. We should share lists. Like some of you got a list of what's next on your list to watch, right? Some of y'all, some of y'all got a, I love a good Netflix binge. Would you consider just for a second, what if your life was a show and you're on episode, for me, 46, because I'm 46 years old. What if each year was an episode? What episode are you on? Don't say it out loud because I know some of y'all, that's a big, it's a big secret. You ain't trying to disclose that publicly. But just say to yourself, huh, I'm on episode 60, I'm on episode 71, I'm on episode 23, I'm on episode 
37. You know, what, what episode are you on? Now, here's the next question I want you just to answer, think about, ponder in your mind. What story are you telling so far? What story are you telling? If your life was a story and you're on episode whatever, so far, what story are you telling? Here's another one. Can I go a little deeper? Here's another one. Um, Is it time for a plot twist? You know how you get in a series and you just hit a lull? It's like, oh, the last couple of episodes, uh, season a little, oh, a little blah. Are, are some of you in a blah season? Is it time for a, to- a, a, a plot twist? If it's your story and you're getting bored with it, you can only imagine what kind of story you're telling Dan with it. <laughs> can, we go, can we go a little deeper? How do you want this story to end? Because let me tell you something, ain't nothing worse than a bad ending to a story. Doesn't matter how it starts, but it does matter how it finishes. Here's the trippy thing about the ending. Like, what story do you, what, what, what ending do you imagine for your story? But here's the, here's the conundrum. We don't know when the story will end. But we all know it's going to end. So how do we live daily with the end in mind? Are are y'all with me? Like, how do you live daily with the end in mind? How do you go to bed tonight and say, because here's the reality check. This could be our last day. This could be the last episode. And so have I lived this day in this particular episode in a way that when I lay my head to pillow tonight, I can say, it is well. It is well. I, I'm convinced some of us, we don't take time to think about the ending off, often enough. Because if you want to have a good ending, you need to have a well-intended ending. And you can make choices that can shape your ending. You don't, you can't, you, I, I get it, I get it. You don't know when, and we all assume that we got more time than we do have. So we all, we all assume that we got more time but we don't know when that last episode of life will be, but we can know that it ends well with your assurance with God. I guess the fundamental question that I want to ask and that I want to spend our time unpacking is, are you living a story worth telling? Are you living a story worth telling? you have to know the way the gospel works and the way the good news of Jesus spreads is through your story. That's why we got it. It was Peter's story. It became Paul's story. It became Timothy's story. And they passed it on and on and on until we're here now and we've heard the story. My thing is, who's going to pass the story on to the next generation? Oh, you just think it's only preachers that's supposed to pass the story? Child, you know we're in trouble if that's the case. There are some people that will hear your story that will never hear mine. There are some people that will respond to you and your experience with the, the, with the divine in a way unlike they would ever ex- respond to me and mine. So if we're going to love one another well, a part of it has to be us, number one, living a story well enough to be told so that our story might be passed on. Love tells the story of love. And you are a story of love. Whether you realize it yet or not, you are. So what I want to talk about in our remaining time together is how do we live a story worth telling? How do we live a story worth telling? Number one, if you're taking notes, write this down. Surrender the pen. If you want to live a story worth living, number one, you don't get to write it. First thing we got to do is surrender the pen to God and say, God, if this story's got any shot at turning out right or good, God, you got to write it. You got to write it simply because he's a much better writer than you. 
He's just a much better writer than you. And the worst thing you can do is try to spend time, and this is what we do. We do it all the time. We will write our full story. Some of you know exactly how you want your story to go, and you got it all written out, and then you get to the end, and you say, now, Jesus, if you could just sign right here at the bottom. If you can just sign off on everything I got, and if you look closely, you'll notice I got some things that you like. I got some scriptures in there. I got all my kids are going to be virgins till they get married. I know you like that. that was, your mama was a virgin, so I know you like that one. Like, like you're going to go down, and you're going to put all this stuff in here and say, God, I'll, and if God try to edit, no, 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 don't change anything, God. If you could just, if you could just sign at the bottom, that's all I need you to do. Really, I got everything else. God says, no, I'm not, I didn't die on the cross to be your co-signer. I didn't die on the cross so we can co-write together. First thing you need to understand about your life is you cannot write it. And for some of you, that's a big moment because some of you are stuck right now in a season where you are writing and you're frustrated because what you're writing, you're not seeing. And your prayer has been, God bless what I write. Come on, can we just be honest? You ain't saying God have your way. You're saying God bless what I've written. Because I believe in what I've written. I consulted with some of your scriptures, a couple of them. I put them on there and I prayed a lot. God bless what I've written. And God loves you too much to bless your handwriting. He loves you too much to bless your bad handwriting. You got to surrender the pen. That's the only way this happens. And some of you, you're in a season and you're frustrated with God. You're feeling the tension with God. You're even walking, wrestling with your faith. God, how can you? How could you? How did you? How? And you're just struggling with it. And God is saying, this struggle feels so overwhelming because you refuse to release the pen. You refuse to let me write in this season. And you're frustrated. Can I tell you, trust God's hand. He's a better writer than you. He's a better writer than you. And watch this. He wants to write through your life. He's the pen, but you're the paper. So he's saying, I, my greatest joy and my greatest desire is to use you for my story. To use you so that I might so impact your story that the world might know me through you. He says, I want to use you like that. Each and every one. Imagine if that was our one job. Last thing you want to do is get to heaven and hear Peter sarcastically say, you had one job. (laughs) You had one job. How many people have you told? How many people did you tell? How many times did you share your story? And I'm not talking about the creepy old school way where you go home uh, people door and knock on the door and scare the hell out of them. I'm not talking about that. You know what I mean? Y'all know those people, hey, if you die tonight, would you go to heaven or to hell? <laughs> well, excuse me, uh, Mr. Johnson, I hadn't really thought about that today. I was just getting, putting the keys down for a bath. You know what I mean? Let's, let's, no, 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 no. But next time you're having coffee and somebody asks you about you, you can say, let me tell you about me and the God who made me. He's the source of everything you see. When was the last time you gave him a shout out for anything? Or do you have your coworkers thinking you just great? H- Hello in here, somebody. Like God is saying, I want to use your life to tell my story. So in many ways, he's saying, surrender the pen, but pick up the mic. Because I want your life to speak through my pen that I write on your life. So he's saying, no, 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 don't, don't be quiet. No, I need you to get louder, but be loud with what I wrote. Surrender the pen, pick up the mic, and allow your life to speak. Some of you got kids, don't even know your faith testimony. You drag them to church and tell them to pray all the time. They have no idea why you believe this stuff. You've never told them your testimony. You never say, hey, uh, I ain't going to say that. But uh, you, you should just tell your testimony. <laughs> Girl, mama was something else back in 87, child. You just have no idea. Papa was a rolling stone. Yeah. Like, like, like whatever, whatever it is, 
They deserve to know where it comes from. You just tell them to be something. How did you become something? As a matter of fact, in Revelation, it talks about how you, you overcome by the blood of the lamb and the words of your testimony. I don't have to unpack that, but the blood of the lamb, we know what that is. Like, that's the blood. So, like, are you going to compare? Like, you put on the same footing my testimony and the blood? You know what God is saying? He's saying your testimony is powerful like the blood. And, and he says that's how you overcome. Maybe why you ain't overcome nothing is because you ain't told nothing. Closed mouths don't get fed. Y'all heard that saying? Maybe, maybe with no testimony, it's hard for you to overcome. And I get it. Some of you, just the very sight and the idea of you displaying your life or speaking your life, it creates, um, <laughs> you just get sweaty. Uh, <laughs> you just get nervous. You get, because the idea of being vulnerable, the idea is that, but let me tell you something. That's a part of it. One of the worst things that we were ever told is, Never let them see you sweat. That's the dumbest thing I've ever heard in my life. Do you know what happens to you if you don't sweat? You overheat. You can have a stroke. You can die. So what if, what if, it, what if it came to this thought that let them see you sweat? Inevitably, you're going to wobble a little bit. You're not going to come out the gate walking. I said, here, let me tell you my story. Like, it's, it's, I get it. It's going to require a little sweat. It's going to require a wobble. You're going, you're going to struggle a little bit. You get, it's like a baby. When they get ready to walk, <laughs> like the fear of standing up the first time and wobbling, they're like, oh, I don't think I'm supposed to do that. And then, bam, they sit down. They're like, quick, oh, Lord, that was, I don't know what that was, but that didn't feel right. That felt unstable in all its ways. You know what I mean? So they just went, oh, woo. They said, let me go back to crawling. That is much safer. But we know on the other side of the wobble is walking. So you just got to wobble through it. And then, you know, we, when, they, when they be wobbling, and then we be looking like, oh, oh, oh. And they're like, oh, I'm scared. Let me sit down. This is. <laughs> but then the first time they take that, oh, whoa. I'm doing what the big people do. Wait a minute. Boom. And then they start walking. But it required a wobble. So as I talk about you telling your story, as I talk about you thinking about the kind of story you want to live that's worthy of telling and you're scared about the wobble, would you just turn to your neighbor and just tell them, wobble baby, 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 wobble. I only did that because I wanted to dance with this mic. I was trying to figure out how can I dance? How can I get my Bruno Mars on with this mic? And it was in the wobble, you know what I mean? Yo. What, is, what, is it, what would it mean for you to wobble to a testimony that overcomes? You have a story. Every last one of you. And Satan's greatest desire is to rob you of it. Or to convince you that you really don't have one. Yeah. That's those other people. Those other people got one. Well, I ain't got no story. Not, 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 not me. Yeah, you do. Surrender the pen, and you'll be amazed at what God does. Not only surrender the pen, but point number two that I want you to write down, take this down, um, there, listen to this, there will be plot twists and conflict. There will be. And this is why you got to surrender the pen, because watch this. One thing about pain, you will never write it in your story. That's why you can't have the pen, because you never write pain. You never write pain. And we all said, most of some of y'all said it, a good story requires what? Conflict. A good story requires a good plot twist. A good story requires an overcoming of something, something I had to get down, then I had to get up. It's a part of a good story, but you will never put it in your own story. We'd have some of the wackiest stories ever written. Because our story would be good, 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 plot twist, greater, greater, greater. <laughs> you, you, you never write in pain. You never write in conflict. You never write in a plot twist 
that disrupted everything that you had just set up in the previous season. But here's the thing. God will. God will. So you got to trust this pen. God, there are certain people you would have never written out of your life. But God did. And you need to trust his pen because there are characters that were in season one that will not be there in season three. But if you get the pen and try to write characters in, you're going to mess up the ultimate storyline that God has for you because you couldn't deal with the edit and the change in the episode. Are are y'all in here with me? Sometimes we hold on to characters and the people and things that God's trying to write out. Because although your season isn't over, theirs is. And there are times when you have to release people when their season is over in your life, but you got another season coming. Everybody can't go with you. Ooh, this is helping somebody today. I don't care, I don't know where you are, but you up in here. Turn around and just tell your neighbor, everybody can't go with you. And watch this, watch this, watch this. Be careful. I'm so guilty of this. I'm so guilty of this. Be careful of trying to hold on to people when you're supposed to be pronouncing a benediction. you still holding on to them. And you preserve it. And you become like Lot's wife. Y'all remember what happened to Lot's wife? Homegirl couldn't let it go. And they said, all right, you turn around one more time. And she turned around and she turned into a pillar of salt. And we've talked about this before. Y'all know why she turned into salt, don't you? Salt in that day was used to what? Preserve. You pack, we have frigid ass. Uh, we refrigerators. You, you, uh, you, you, you use salt to preserve meat, to preserve, because it would hold things. She was preserving a chapter that God was writing her out of. And she refused to let it go. And she held on and she turned into salt. Some of you, you're wondering why you so salty? It's because you holding on to something you should let go. Turn around and ask your neighbor, why you so salty? Come on. Why you so salty? Can I, can I go a little deeper on this one? Some of you, you can't even embrace the new character that he's bringing in because you're still stuck in the bitterness of the loss of the character that just left. So there's fresh love and opportunity for you in the next season, but you can't even receive it because you're so salty from the loss in the last season. Amen in here, somebody? Yeah. And, and is that too general? I'm, I'm sorry. You can't get the new man God got for you <laughs> because you still stuck DMing the old man. Hello, hello somebody. And you keep asking God for a good man, but you lying because you attracted to a bad man. (laughs) And first of all, you got to tell the truth and confess and surrender your palate that's gotten used to abusive jokers that you don't even know how to appreciate the good godly man that God is trying to bring in your life. Did you see that plot twist I just gave you in this sermon? (laughs) Some of you didn't even see that coming, right? talking about some he corny because he didn't want to pray and he'd be on the phone with his mama and trying to go to church. Girl, <laughs> talking about I want somebody a little rough. Why? Your life ain't rough enough already? <laughs> you want to add rough to this? Seriously? <laughs> you better get your life. What are you doing? There are some, some of you, they're, they're new friends. You had, you had your turn up friends. But God is bringing you into a season to where what you're about to go through, girl, you need some friends that can pray you through a storm. You, you ain't got a friend that can pray you out of a brown paper bag. <laughs> Fella, I, I, need, I need some boys in my life that know how to get to the throne of grace and not just get to a bag of weed. He- hello in here, somebody. I need somebody that can do more than tequila shots. You, you know what I'm saying? Like you're in a season where the weight that you're carrying and the purpose that you've got inside of you, you need folks that can help you carry purpose. You need folks that can help you carry life. So you just need to make sure you got friends. It's good. You got, don't, don't get rid of your turn up friends. You see what I'm saying? You got that one weekend where God going to give you a shot. No, I'm just playing. I'm just playing. <laughs> oh, 
I, I, I just realized there was, you go through seasons of hell where it gets rough, where I, I need to call. I got friends I can call and just cry, and they'll just start praying in the spirit over me. You, you know what I'm saying? I got friends that I was like, hey, and they, they send me a word from Jesus. Say, hey, bro, I was praying for you today, and the Lord spoke to me about you. So just, I, you need that kind of friend. You need that. And God may be writing in those characters in this season. Be open to new relationships that he's writing in. People that will push you to godliness. People that will push you to purpose. Are, are, are y'all with me? There will be plot twists, plot twists. And here's the deal. Don't fear the pain so much to where you miss the presence and the purpose of God. We are so scared of change and pain and hard that we miss the glory that God's revealing in those moments. In Corinthians, Paul talks about taking us in the presence of God from glory to glory. See, I thought I was going from storm to storm. He says, no, you're going from glory to glory. Because in each glory, it's not from one destination, but it's from one revelation. I'm, I'm giving you a new revelation of who I am. You've never known me in this place before. So I've brought you to a place that feels like despair, but you don't realize God was there. And in that, he's bringing you to a new kind of air, a new, a new space. Uh, Courtney, I got that, got that rhyming spirit on me. I'm trying to freestyle a little bit. I feel, I feel a little rap thing going on. But, uh, he's, but, but, but he's bringing you to a new air of revelation. So yeah, you ain't never had a friend disappoint you like this, but you've never seen God's glory revealed to you in a season where you had a friend disappoint you like this. I'm doing something in you that's never been done before. So it's not what I'm taking you through. It's more so what I'm revealing inside of you. And that's my glory. Somebody say his glory is there. Don't, don't underestimate the power of pain and how God will use it for his glory. Can I talk to some people that's in pain? Can I talk to some people that's experiencing hard times? Can I talk to some people that feel like you've got wounds? Jean uh, Marie, Marie, uh, she, Jean Marie Jobs uh, is, a, is um, a mentor and a leadership coach of mine, and she is hands down one of the most irritating people that you will ever spend time with. <laughs> oh, she gets on my last nerve. Oh my goodness. Because she says things like this. We're talking about wounds. And I'm talking about the ones I got, and they bleed, and I'm wounded, and I'm hurt. And she said, she said, you know, Albert, wounds actually can be a portal to new vision if you don't judge them prematurely. What? Like, this sounds so irritating. Did you just put a positive spin on wounds? And then as she talks about being abused as a child, um, experiencing molestation and growing up in an abusive home, and how through those wounds, God used that open sore space to be a portal to bring forth a vision that is now the work that she does with her life. So if you find passionate people that are walking in purpose, a lot of times if you go hit rewind and say, where did that come from? It came from a place of pain that they said, I refuse to allow that to perpetuate in the earth. And I've got a vision of how I want to use my life now. And it is to bring healing to people who have that kind of pain. Are y'all, are y'all with me? Here's the caveat, though. She says, if you don't judge it prematurely. And see, what we do with pain is we judge it and we say, this is here to destroy me and I hate it and I want to, da, 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 da. In, a, in a good, a good womb that's, that's good and open, the last thing you want to do is cover it and smother it. Yeah. That's what I learned when I was a kid. You get a bad accident, I'll, I just want a Band-Aid and just keep it. At some point, you need to take the Band-Aid off and let it what? Yeah. Ah, because the healing is in the... So you think you're just going to keep those wounds hidden you got? No, God says air them out. It's got to be aired out because it is in the air. But if you judge it prematurely, judging it to me is putting a Band-Aid on, just say this, it needs to be covered up. It needs to be hidden. He said, don't, don't judge it. This might be an opportunity for God to do a redemptive work 
in the deepest place of your pain and hurt. God may want to do something redemptive here, so don't cover it up. Be open to what God wants to do. Amen, somebody? I'm saying God will take the good, the bad, and the ugly and use it to be a blessing to somebody. It's like a cake. Anybody know how to make a good pound cake? Who know how to make a good pound cake in here? Anybody? Come on, sister. Hey, man. No longer. Anybody else? We got some good pound cakes, sister Leslie. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take you up. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try, try you out and see if it's true now. Yo, I love, a good, I love a good pound cake, but the ingredients of a pound cake are disgusting. I mean, what we got? What we got? Flour? Flour, right? When's the last time you took somebody took a handful of flour and was like, girl? What's happening? You want some of this? No. Ain't nobody doing that. A stick of butter? How many sticks of butter are you putting in it? No, London. A pound of butter? Sha. Pound cake. A pound of butter? When's the last time somebody ate a pound of butter just sitting there? Child, what you doing? Just sitting there eating my butter, girl. Ain't nobody doing that. Raw eggs, right? Some eggs in there. Ain't nobody eating no raw eggs. I mean, you know, some of y'all, but not us. We ain't eating no raw eggs. You know what I mean? Like, what? But how is it that you take all those things and you whip it together and it turns into something good? If, if Nolanda can do that with a pound cake, imagine what God can do with the elements of your life that individually don't taste good, but God says all things work together for the good of those who love me. He can work it all together. And it becomes something beautiful and tasteful and something worth sharing. Quick story, um, friend of ours, um, Anahita and Matthew, born in Iran, uh, transformed by the gospel. It's illegal to be a Muslim in the tr to convert to Christianity. It's against the law in Iran. But God's got a way of doing what he wants to do. They um, give their lives to Jesus, and they start a secret church. They call it the underground church, where they're just discipling and evangelizing folks. And they find themselves now in a room downstairs in the basement, lights low, whispering worship song. The Iranian police spying on them and the work that they were doing along with others, on Christmas Day, came and arrested them. The arrest was such a big deal that they had it on the local news. Underground Christian church network disbanded, and they were celebrated. <laughs> Check this out. It was a guy who saw the news thing, never heard of Christianity, looked up what a Christian was, and gave his life to Jesus Christ. <laughs> God's got a way of doing what he wants to do. They, um, Anahita, the wife, and Matthew, the husband, got sentenced to um, soli soli solitary, solitary confinement. Um, she spent 23 days. He spent 45. Many years later, we're sitting down around the table and we're, and we're, we're talking of their experience. I said, so what was it like? He said, restful. And he laughed. He said, I slept for days. Because <laughs> they had been doing so much work in the ministry that he was just exhausted. Like an irritated wife, she slapped him on the shoulder and said, well, while you was in there resting, I couldn't sleep. <laughs> she, um, she couldn't sleep. She, it was almost as if she could still see the room. She looked up and she said, there was a light right over here. The toilet was there and the bed was right there. And the bed, it, by that we mean two blankets on the floor, on the ground. And this light up to the right stayed on all 23 days and never went off. So even when she would try to sleep, she would try to cover her eyes, but the light would still come through. Not only that, but there was anxiety because she had heard of the rape that would happen to women in prison. So she didn't sleep much. As a matter of fact, 
a part of their goal was to dull them mentally. So even arresting them on Christmas was to try to destroy the holiday. She said it would be years before she could celebrate Christmas again with joy. They, um, they did their time, and like here, they were able to get out on bail. So they got out on bail um, awaiting their trial and sentencing. But their families said, there's no way you're going to make it. So they got together, pooled resources, and smuggled them out of the country. And they were able to get out by God's grace, and they snuck out and got to Turkey and sought refugee status over here. Even still today, they're wanted criminals there in Iran. Um, they started a church in Turkey for people like them. Um, they started with five people, um, and it grew to 400 people, one of the largest churches of that kind in the world. Um, in 2015, uh, George and I, the, the chair of our board, this, this guy with the cool shoes sitting right here, um, <laughs> we show up to Turkey, and two weeks before we got there, two weeks before we got there, they received their paperwork to be accepted into America. I don't know how all it works, but basically when you seek refugee status, they, they process you, uh, and then they assign you to a city in America that you can go to. Um, so they'll send you to Oklahoma, you got to go to Oklahoma, you got to go whatever. Guess what city they got assigned to? Pasadena. Wow. So we show up and we're there um, and they're leaving the next week. They're coming to Pasadena. So um, and when we get there, they do their one last baptism as the pastor of that region and that community. It was 150 people baptized at one time. One of the largest baptisms of Muslims to that time, to that date, one of the largest. Um, fast forward a couple of months, we get here to fellowship, and Matthew and Anahita are in the service, and they're worshiping with us. Um, and I'll never forget, at the end of the service, Matthew was just walking around, and was just looking. And I said, what is it, Matthew? What? What? And I'll never forget what he said. He said, worship so loud. <laughs> we don't have to whisper anymore. God's using their life to tell a beautiful story of his glory with plot twist, with devastation and disappointment. Their sentence now in Iran is up to about 30 years because they've discipled so many people that have gone back into Iran that keep doing the same work that they're doing. Every time their name comes up, they just keep adding to their sentence. I'm telling you, sometimes when God's writing to your story, he'll add to the sentence. Y'all see what I did there? See what I did? Story, sentence, come on. Oh, come on, guys. That's so good. Oh, my God. <laughs> I, I guess what I want to say is um, you never know how he'll want to use your story. You never know how he wants to use your story. So what, why don't you own this philosophy? And this is my third point, and we'll go home on this. What if, what if you said, my life, his story? What if you made that commitment? My life, his story. I want to surrender to him. I want him to get glory out of my story. And I can already hear some of you saying, uh, pff, I ain't never been to jail. Well, and then I hear some of y'all saying, I have been to jail. <laughs> <laughs> It's not about a dramatic story. It's about a transformed story. It's about a transformed story. It ain't got to be deep and wonderful, a lot of plot twists and stuff. As a matter of fact, it was a guy in the Bible. He was blind. He was a beggar. And Jesus healed him and saved him. And it's in John chapter 9. Um, a couple of days later, people are interrogating him almost about the person that that healed him. You know what I mean? So they're like, who was it? Was he a sorcerer? Was he a sinner? Was it? And I love it. This is one of the greatest, most powerful testimonies you'll ever read in scripture. Do we have that scripture? I, I want y'all to see it. We're going to put it up. Uh, John uh, chapter 9. We got it? Oh, there it is. Okay, so this is him replying to the people that's trying to figure out what happened. He replied, 
Whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. That's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Amen, somebody? Can I just tell you, if you're looking for a testimony, you can start with that one. I was blind, but now I see. That's my story. I was lost, but now I'm found. That's my story. I was undone, and now I'm done. That's my story. The old saints would say, this is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song. Anybody willing to praise your Savior? Anybody? Oh, come on in here, church. Anybody willing to praise your Savior all the day long? Why? Because he's writing my story. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Anybody thankful for the amazing grace of God? He says, this is my story. This is my song, and it's word to be told. Y'all sit down, I ain't done. I got one more thing, and then we're going to go. Woo! It's that kind of passion, though, that we need to take to people who don't know, who haven't heard. Y'all, we should be some, we should be some of the most passionate people in earth. The story of God's redemption? Oh, he's been too good for you to be that bitter. There's a story of a couple, they just inspire me. They're working in the underground church in Iran. And it's a couple, and look, they got, a, they got an understanding. Not if we get arrested, it's when. First of all, come on. Oh my God. And so they got a plan. They said, nah, we don't, we don't, you say this, I say this, this is what we say, this is what we do. They got a plan. Inevitably, they get, arrested. they get arrested. And they're being interrogated. And the church, the underground church has gotten so wide and so big now. And it's a crime to convert from Muslim to Christianity. The interrogator says, listen, you converted, whatever. He almost, it's almost like we've given up on you refusing Christ. But then he says, but why y'all got to keep telling people? Like, I get you did it, but why you got to tell people? Why you got to keep telling so many people? Implication, y'all making it hard on us. And what he said is he looked at his wife and they smiled and he said, you know those Bibles you confiscated from our home? He said, yeah. He said, would you, would you mind go grabbing one? So he grabs a Bible and the man turns the Bible to Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. And then he says, here, read this. Then Jesus came to them and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And then he says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And watch this, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even in prison to the very end of the age. And he said, that's why we won't stop talking. That's why we've got to keep telling people because it's a mandate from God that we tell our story so that all nations may know that he is king of kings. He is Lord of lords. He is almighty. He is all powerful. And he has given himself for all of us. So that's why we keep telling the story. And that's why you've got to keep telling the story. 
That's why you got to tell the story. His pen, but y'all, we got to pick up the mic. And we got to tell the story. Because there are people who haven't heard. There are people who haven't seen. And God told me to tell you, he's not done with you yet. I said he's not done with you yet. There's so much more to your story. See, some of you, can I just, can I just prophet? I just, pro- I just want to prophesy right in here and say the devil is after your story. He wants you to think that your failure was fatal. But God says, there's so much more to your story. I'm not done writing. As a matter of fact, I'm just getting started. And I'm going to use everything from every season to bring you to the fullness of my glory. Some of you, you in here and you want, I don't have anything to say. I don't have God. That is a lie from the pit of hell. God wants to use you. He wants to use your story. And even while I'm talking, some of you are disqualifying yourself that way. It's not talking to me. I'm too old. If you don't, I don't care if you're 70, 80, 90, God's not done with you. Girl, you still look good. You still got it. Brother, you still moving around. You don't move as fast as you used to. And hey, we don't need you moving that fast no way. Slow your behind down so we can hear what's going on. Some of you sitting there, you're so young. And you're thinking your youth disqualifies you. David was 14 when he got in the game. Jesus was 12 when he started looking and investigating and being curious about how God might fully bring his purpose into fruition on the earth. You're not too young. Some of you, you messed up so bad. Some of you still got little things that you do that things disqualify you. Let me tell you something. We all got something. See, the devil is alive. See how only one person said amen? I ain't got none. Turn around and tell your neighbor. I said, we all got something. Your something doesn't disqualify you from being used by God. As a matter of fact, God may use that something to get glory out of your life. Maybe he wants to replace that something with him and to show you life without that something so that you might be filled with something that's greater than that something. Amen, somebody? I guess I just want you to know he's not done with you yet. There's so much more to your story. He's still writing. And I guess the commitment is, if he keeps writing, will you keep telling? Come on. Because you only got one job for his glory. Amen. 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 Would you just close your eyes and allow these words to wash over you? You're not done with me yet. Yeah. You're not done with me yet. He's saying there's so much more. There's so much more to the story. He's not. You're not done with me yet. You're not done with me yet. Would you just sing that over your life? Just sing it. You're, You're not, not done, done with me yet. yet. Sing this over your life. There's so much more to the story. Brother, God's not done. You're not done with Girl, God's not me done. Yet. You're not? You're, You're not, not done, done with me yet. God, I'm still in the game. I'm still in the game. You're not done with me yet. There's still purpose inside my chest. There's so much more to the story. Yeah. You're not done with me. One last time. Lift that up, church. Sing it over your yet. life. Come on. You're, You're not, not done, done with me yet. yet. Hey. Oh, yeah. You're not done with me yet. There's so much more. There's so much more to the story. You're yeah. not done. You're not done with me yet. Everyone standing. Just um, 
turn and tell three people around you, your next season, I can't wait to see it. Tell them, yeah, I can't wait to see your next season. I can't wait to see your next season. Oh, I can't wait to see your next season. Hey, and just in case they had some doubt, would you just, I'm going to give you, you got 30 seconds to be a prophet. I'm anointing you to be a prophet, all right? So you got to, so wait, but don't waste it. I'm going to tell you how to use your prophetic voice. Turn to them and prophesy over their life and tell them this next season is going to be good. Tell them, tell them. Tell them, tell them. Prophesy, tell them. It's going to be good. 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 Now, if you receive it, you ought to give God a good praise. If you receive it, it's going to be good. 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 Hey, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. Help me. You know I can't sing. Come on, do it. Hey. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. Just in case you're wondering, I'm repeating that because somebody needs that to settle in their belly. Somebody, I don't know who you are, where you are, but where the word of God wants to land in you, it's anxiety right there. So when you think about it being good, you think about it, all you feel is the anxiety. And I want it to slow down so the goodness of God can make it down into the anxiety. And I just want you to speak to that anxiety and declare and decree, it's going to be good. Yeah. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. Speak to the anxiety and tell it. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. Say, it's going to be good. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. You're thinking about the marriage, but I'm telling you. It's going to be good. Thinking about the finances, but I'm telling you. You're thinking about the cancer, but I'm telling you. You're thinking about all the worries, but it's going to be good. So just receive it and speak it over your life. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. Yeah. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. Father, we pray that all things work together for good. You are a good God. And even in storms, you're revealing glory. And even through wounds, you're producing vision and purpose. So thank you for being a God that uses all. Thank you for using the, the tasteless flower in my life. Thank you for using the butter in my life. Thank you for using the raw eggs in my life. And thank you for working it together for my good. Now, as we leave this place, our prayer is simple, Father. Just work it, God. Work it, God. Work it, God. Work it, God. The elements of my story, I surrender the pen. I receive the plot twist. As long as you work it for our good. May this be the story we take out to those who haven't seen, who haven't heard, who don't know. We are a bunch of people who were once blind, but now we see. And what we've seen is that it's going to be good for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. If you believe that, give God glory in this place. God bless you, fellowship. Have a great week. Hey, it's gonna be good.